What a great day to be in church. Oh, hey, it is great to be here, great to have you here, and real privilege for me to be able to, to bring this series together at the end and conclude it, and um, just always a privilege to get a preach in our church, because um, we have just a fantastic church. You are brilliant, and we love you, and we love the opportunity to be part of church together. Listen, um, a couple of things before I really get into the message. Let me just give you a couple of scriptures that I want to sort of preface this with um, to talk about the whole of this series. I love what Pastor Solf just said about the purpose of this series is to bring order out of chaos. Listen, if you've ever been in a difficult financial situation, you know what chaos feels like. You know what it's like when you can't see the way through, you can't see the way to work it out, and then there's a moment where everything comes back together and you go, ah, oh, I can live with this order. That is the work of God from creation in Genesis to revelation. That's what God's doing. He's taking the chaos of our lives, the chaos of this world, and he's pulling it all back together to accomplish his plan and his purpose that is the very best thing for our lives. God does not want us living in poverty. He wants us to live in blessing. He has the best for you, and we want to really speak into that today. Is that going to be good? Yeah. Awesome. Let me give you two scriptures. First of all, Galatians chapter 5. It's going to come up on the screen. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Listen, this message is all about freedom. Because God doesn't want you trapped by anything. He wants you to live a free life where he is the only thing that rules over our lives. And there's two things that can really fight for rulership with you. It's money and God. And it's your decision who rules over your life. You cannot serve, the Bible tells us, both God and money. And God wants you set free and money will keep you under its heel. So first of all, this is all about freedom. It's not about rules and regulations. It's not about what you must do. It's about how do we equip you so you can live free. That's what I want for you. The second verse is this. Find it in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. It's coming from the screen again. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You may have listened to some of this series and you thought to yourself, oh, if, if someone had just told me this way back when, if someone had told me before I took out a credit card, if someone would have told me before I took that law, if someone would have told me before, 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 listen, there's no condemnation in the room. If you've got a story, we've all got a story. We've all got a past. We've all got mistakes. We've all got things that, that are there. There's no condemnation. So if you're learning things for the first time in this series, and we really pray and hope you are, then just put them into practice. Don't beat yourself up. Don't let anybody else beat you up over it. Put them into practice and find a way to move forward. That's what we want to do. Is that okay? Yeah. Awesome. So good. Um, can, I, um, can, can I share you a little gilly secret? Is that all right? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. All right at the back, is that okay? No. All right, just close your ears for a minute. I'm, I'm, online, I'm going to share a little guilty secret. You ready? Right? This is it. I love shoes. <laughs> I do. I love shoes. There's something a little odd, though, when most people suddenly look, look you up and down. Because a lot of you checked out my shoes at that moment, right? I'm, I, I love shoes, but there's two things you need to know. Number one, I don't feel guilty. And number two, it's not really much of a secret. Um, it's one of those things that kind of like, you know, I, I love shoes. I, I, I just, and I love looking at shoes. But the problem with looking at shoes is you, you buy shoes. So, you know, I will pretty regularly, I, I, I look at shoes, you know, and I'm, I'm hanging out. I had the real privilege of looking after Pastor Neil for a couple of days. And uh, Pastor Neil and I have one real great passion outside of Jesus, which is shopping. So we went, we went shopping together, and uh, we had a day at Cheshire Oaks, and we were just like, oh, do you like those? Oh, I like those shoes. Oh, I like those shoes. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great day, but I, I didn't. I'm only talking to one person in the room now. I didn't buy any shoes. I bought a few other things, but I didn't buy any shoes. Um, it, it's just, it's, I, I just love doing it. And there were times in, in our married life when we would look at our finances, and we would ask this question. Maybe you've asked this question. Here's the question. Where... Did all the money go? Now, sometimes the answer was shoes. 
Sometimes, you know, at a moment, at a day, and what I would have done is I would have gone, oh, I've seen this pair of shoes. Oh, I really like those shoes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have those. And, and I confess there were times when I bought things I shouldn't have bought. But more often than not, and maybe this is how it lands in your home, you ask the question, where did all the money go? And the answer is, we don't know. You ever get to that point in the month? Where you suddenly look at it and you think, what, what do we actually buy? Like, with that, there's no, it's not like there's a, there's a new telly that you can point at. I'm just making a point to my family. There should be a new telly that we can point at, but there's not. So where did all the money go? And it's interesting that we make decisions not just today, but historically that decide where our money's gone. For instance, if you've either bought a house or you rent a house, there was a day where you signed a piece of paper that meant that every month there was some money you no longer decided where it went. Your rent or your mortgage, it's, it's coming out and it's, it's gone. You don't have any control over it. And maybe at some point, um, you, you signed up for a mobile phone contract. You know, you signed up, you thought it was a great deal, and then you realized you had 15 years on this contract. That's why it looked like a great deal. And, um, and you're like, man alive. And you, you know, this money is coming out month in, month out. You no longer have control because you made a promise based on that money. And there's a whole host of things, your water, your electricity, your council tax, live in Trafford, lowest council tax in the country, worth moving. And so there's some great stuff there that you can go, oh, okay, we, get, we, we made some decision once that put you here, but there's another bunch of money that is available to you to do with what you want to do with it. You're going to spend it on whatever you want to do. You're going to spend it on some fun money. You're going to go to the cinema. You're going to go out for a meal. You're going to spend it on some clothes. You're going to spend it on your kids. You're going to spend it on the dog. Whatever it is that you're going to spend your money on, that becomes in your hands and your choice. Now, I actually think you have a decision about this money. And here's the decision, and this is the idea of this message is this. Are you going to throw it or are you going to sow it? The money that you actually have capacity and control over, are you going to throw it and it's gone? Or are you going to sow it and it produces something that makes a difference and makes a change in your life? So that's all we're going to talk about this morning. Everybody good? Fantastic. Grab your Bible. We're turning to Exodus and we're turning to chapter one of Exodus. And um, it's probably worth doing a previously in Exodus. And so the story of Exodus chapter one is this. Joseph, who at the end of his amazing technical dream court is living in Egypt with his entire family. He is really the ruler of Egypt under Pharaoh. And um, we need to change this because that's crackling a lot. Okay, I'll carry on. Um, Joseph is the ruler of Egypt. A new pharaoh comes along who decides that actually I don't remember what Joseph did because there's some things that you did that you no longer do. There's some changes that happen and changes that occur that push you out of where you should have been and you find yourself in a more difficult and more awkward place. And that's what's happened in Exodus chapter one. The people of God, it looks like they have been um, forgotten or pushed aside a new pharaoh has appeared thank you so much um, a new pharaoh has appeared and this new pharaoh has created a new set of rules about God's people and here we go Exodus chapter 1 we're reading from verse 17 it reads like this the, the midwives however feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do they let the boys live because this was the rule if a Hebrew boy is born, he has to be thrown into the Nile. He has to be killed. They did not do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? So the midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous. And give birth before the midwives arrive. And, you know, no man is going to counter that argument. So Pharaoh kind of goes, oh, all right, okay, all right, didn't know that. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And here, this is exactly the principle that Pastor Glenn just talked about. If you keep doing the right thing, God blesses you. And because the midwives feared God, 
He gave them families of their own. Because they did the right thing, the right way. God honored it and blessed them. He gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Wow. I mean, it's easy to read the Bible and skip through to what we know comes next. Moses. It's easy to skip through. But pause for a moment and think about the crisis and the mess that this is causing in this nation called Israel. That every family... And not either their immediate family or they know someone who has gone through this moment where they've had to throw their boy into the Nile, probably at spear point, forced to do it by Pharaoh's people, by the Egyptians, made to do this. And it's got to cause chaos. It's got to be weeping and distraught. It's got to, well, it's got to feel, it's difficult. It's a very difficult time. Let me tell you, the enemy, the devil, loves to attack things when they are in their infancy. To use the phraseology of the Bible, when they are seed. Because when something is seed, it is at its most vulnerable point. When something is seed, it's unable to protect itself. If they said, hey, we want you to throw every 18-year-old male into the Nile, that would have been a little bit of a different issue than trying to throw a newborn baby into the aisle, into the Nile. It would have been a much more difficult fight. But because they're trying to attack it at sea, listen, let me tell you, it's when your relationship is in its new infancy, but it's going to have significance, that's when the enemy comes against it. He wants to hurt it. When your business is in its infancy, it's in its seed form, it's just getting going. Man, the devil wants to come against you. He wants to attack you. He wants to destroy you. When you're building something new, when you're working on something at that point, of infancy at that point of seed it's at its most vulnerable when did Herod try to kill Jesus when he was a baby when the devil attacked Jesus' ministry before he began it it's always just before at that point of seed that the enemy wants to hit you. And some of you are going through things right now and you're going why is this happening now? It's because God's doing something in you there is a seed that is in you that is for your future you see, for every one of these families, this little boy was their future. He was the guarantee of that sense of immortality of another generation coming. And in your life, there's some things going on that are a guarantee of future, that are speaking into who you will be and what you will do and where you will flourish and prosper. And that's why it's being attacked right now. Whenever the Bible talks about seed, it's talking about money. In fact, you can almost interpose the word seed with money. And it says really clearly that all money is seed. You see, with our finances, you are sometimes throwing away the very thing that contains the potential for your future. You are throwing away the very thing that if you could find a way to sow it, would flourish for the rest of your life. But because you are throwing it, it means that there's no chance for that to do what seed was designed to do. Seed is designed to multiply. It is not designed to just land somewhere. Parable of the sower, which Jesus talks about in, in the book of Luke, reads a little bit like this, and we've got to go there to understand it. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. And some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, yielded a crop. Listen to this phrase. A hundred times... More than was sown. That's not an insignificant number, right? A hundred times more than was sown. And then Jesus tells a joke. You ready? This is Jesus' joke, not mine. He will judge you if you don't find it funny. Then he says, whoever has ears to hear... Let me do that again. 
Whoever has ears to hear, let, let, listen, when corn grows, the top of the piece of corn is called an ear. Let me try it again. It's Jesus' joke, not mine. Whoever has ears, we're talking about seed, right? And it's grown, and they're going to be stood looking at a cornfield. Tough crowd. Who, whoever has ears. So, whenever Jesus told a parable, it was always layered. So there was an immediate piece of information that was obvious to everybody. He's talking about seed. And they're going, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. If it lands on the rocks, it, 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 if it lands on the path, it can't grow because it can't get in. If it lands on the rocks, it can only go a little bit deeper because there's not a lot of depth of soil there and it can be easily stolen away. And if there's weeds around it, it's really hard to, to harvest it. We get that, we get that, we get that. And then they say, but what were you really saying, Jesus? He said, well, I was talking about the word of God. And, and that's what happens when we gather like this. We open the word of God uh, and, and as preachers, this is what we're doing. We're trying to sow the Word of God into your life. We're just trying to sow it into your life. And when you open your Bible at home, God's trying to sow the Word of God into your life. He's trying to get it to land and make an impact in your life. And so some of it, it, it lands on our hard hearts. And it doesn't go in. We hear it, but we don't have the right ears to hear. We just hear words. And then some of it lands on the rockiest where our hearts are a little broken up and something can get in. And it gets in and we, we hear it and at first we go, that's great. And this is what we do. And I know this because I've done it, right? I hear it in church and I think to myself, I'm going to go home and I'm going to do what that says. But by the time I've got home or maybe a few days later, I am not outworking what I heard and received because I've not let it root down into my life. And then there's those where it's sown, but the weeds, and it literally says, the worries of this life choke it. And, and let me guarantee what's happened in the last five weeks. Some of you have gone, I'm going to do that with the money. I'm going to do that with my debt. I'm going to do that with my budget. I'm going to do that with my tithe. And then what's happened is something has choked it. And where the word of God had landed, and it was starting to bear fruit in your life, the worries of life went, and you went, oh, Maybe I won't do it then. I'll do it next month. And there is always a next month. But the seed that fell on good ground went in and produced a crop a hundred times bigger than what was sown. Listen, I used to read that and I used to think to myself, man, what a lousy farmer. How did he manage to land 25% of his seed on the, on the path and 25% of his seed on the stones and 25% you know, where the weeds were going to be? What a lousy farmer. And then I realized this. No, he's not a lousy farmer. I'm a lousy reader. What God's saying is most of the seed of what he's sowing into your life, the goodness of the word of God, what you're hearing in church, what you're reading in your devotions, most of that is looking to produce fruit in your life. You just got to look after it. You've got to water it. You've got to care for it. You've got to encourage it. You've got to cultivate it so that it becomes all that it was meant to be. But it's a, it's a parable, so it's layered. So he's not just talking about literal farming and he's not just talking about the word of God. He's also talking about money because seed always talks about money. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 10 reads like this. Now, he, which is God, who supplies seed to the sower... And bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. God wants to supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge store of seed. He wants to supply and increase your money. Listen, that's not prosperity, that's biblical. He wants to supply and increase your money for two purposes. Some of it is bread to eat. That's the things we've talked about. The bills, the necessities, the things you have to pay for, um, the, the, the cost of life. But a portion of it is seed to be sown. 
And what comes out of what you sow is a harvest of righteousness. God wants your life to produce an incredible harvest of righteousness. He wants what you do with your money to cause glory to go to him, to cause people to recognize, God, this is for you. The seed that, the seed that is bread for eating, eat it. Pay your bills, live your life, have some fun in life as well. Make sure there's money for fun because God wants you to have fun. John 10.10, 10, life to the full, sometimes that needs paying for. So enjoy it and pay for that. But you cannot do that at the expense of sowing. You cannot live a life that just says, hey, th this should all be mine because that's what our culture says. Actually, we've got to follow the biblical principle, which is there is money to, for bread to eat, but there is seed to sow. And if you wait for the end of the month to decide if there's any seed to sow, let me give you a cast iron guarantee. There won't be. Because... You'll have eaten it. Maybe not literally, or maybe literally. God wants to enlarge the harvest of your righteousness, the impact of your life, and he uses our money to do that. So many people are throwing what God has given them to sow. Now, you may be thinking to yourselves, why do we read Exodus chapter 1? Let's go to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2 opens like this. Exodus chapter 1 finished with Pharaoh saying, every boy born gets thrown into the Nile. Exodus chapter 2. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Can you imagine trying to keep a three-month-old quiet? That is a miracle right there. Three months. She hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying. She felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister, so the baby's sister, asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women, I may have one in mind, to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby, nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the time came and the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him up out of the water. Wow. What, a, what an incredible, incredible story. What an incredible piece of narrative that we read there and we go, oh, we love that story, right? But think about it from everyone else's perspective. The culture at the time is saying this. Throw your baby into the Nile. Everybody has a baby boy. Throw him into the Nile. Throw him into the Nile. Every family. Th throw him into the Nile. They're monitoring. They're checking. Throw, throw him into the Nile. Boy or girl? Do you have a boy or a girl? Boy or girl? We'll check. Throw him into the Nile. But one family says, no, no, no. We're not going to do what the culture of the day says we should do. We're not going to follow the rules that the rest of the culture follow. We Just because everybody else does it, just because everybody else lives this way, we are going to treat things differently. So they don't throw him 
into the Nile, they saw him into the Nile. They, they could have gone, do you know what? I, I, I'm going to live beyond my means because that's what everybody else does. But they could have gone, no, no, it's okay. We'll just pay for it on credit card. We, we know we can't afford it, but we want it, so we'll pay for it on credit card. We, we don't need a budget. We'll, we'll be fine. We can just cruise through life. Don't worry about it. That's what everybody else does. Well, we need to move house because, you know, our friends have moved house, so that's what everybody else does. We need a bigger car or we need a newer car because, well, everybody else changes their car every three years, and that's what we need to do. I need new clothes. I need new shoes. I need, I need, and we do what everybody else does and we throw and God's going no, no, no I have a better way for you you ready? four simple principles of sowing and reaping number one here it comes number one you reap what you sow don't overcomplicate this you reap what you sow uh, one of my um it, it is a bit of a fun thing to do. I'm, I'm quite regularly in London, and uh, I was down there this Tuesday, and, and one of the things I like to do is smile at people on the tube. If you've ever traveled the tube, you know nobody's, two, two things don't happen. People, well, three things. One, people don't smile. Two, people don't even look at each other. And three, um, everybody has headphones in. Right? That's what tends to happen. A greeting most of the time in metropolis in London is, starts with, Removing your headphones and then you can start to talk to people. So I, I'm on the tube and, and I think I'm so, I, I, I start smiling at people. Just, just to do, you have to be careful what smile you do. Because, you know, that can be a little creepy or dangerous looking, you know. I don't need some policeman hauling me off a tube and checking my rucksack just because I tried to smile at someone. But I'll smile at people just like, and every now and again, I get really excited and I say, Good morning. I do. I do. I was on the tube um, Tuesday. Uh, last Tuesday, I'd stayed with a friend, and um, we were getting the tube from his house into Westminster. And, um, and we got on. He lives near the end of one of the tube lines, so we hadn't managed to get a seat because um, there were two stops in. And so I got on at the end of tube carriages on certain lines. There's little, like, perches and uh, so I'm, I'm on one of these perches, sort of, you know, one leg up on the perch, you know, this, all my weight's on this leg, and my bag's wedged under my foot because I don't want it stolen. And, um, and, and everyone starts to get on, and as the tube goes further, more and more people get on. So I get to a point where there's a guy sort of with his back to me here. There's one guy nearly sat on my leg. Got a little bit awkward once or twice, you know, not comfortable with that. And then there's this one guy here, literally here. His face is here. And I turn, and my friend stood behind my shoulder, and we've been talking like this. And I turn around and look at this guy. I turn around and look at my friend. He says, no, no, no. I said, yeah. He said, no, no, no. Don't do the good morning thing. <laughs> good morning. Uh, I mean, where does he go? He's got nowhere to go. He's right here. I can see him. Like, his brain's going, huh, huh. What's the response? Good morning. Nice to see you. I thought if I push him anymore, he could break. I don't know. He could snap. Anything could happen. It's amazing. Listen, what you sow, you reap. Ah, a number of times, you know, people come to one of us as pastors and go, Oh, Pastor, I got no friends. Do you know what? What you, come on, church. What you, you, so if you want to have, be a friend, sow friendship into people. If you think, man, no one's ever generous to me, what you, oh, come on, back into it. What you, you, so make sure that you're the person who instigates. Why has someone always got to instigate for you? What if you could become the instigator in our care of one another? What you, you. So why can't you be the one who makes sure you step out, engage with someone, care for them, look after them, make a difference in their life. And when something happens in your life, it's amazing who turns up because you turned up in the first place. If you want happiness in your life, so happiness. If you want people to say good things to you, Pastor Paul has a great line on this. If you can't think of something good to say, think of something good to say. 
and say it to someone and cause that to rise. Principle number one, what you saw, you reap. Principle number two, oh, they're all there. What you, you reap, that threw me, you reap more than you saw. Listen, God is not stingy. He is incredibly generous. And when we respond to him, his response is always over the top. God responds over the top because his normal and our normal don't match. So you always reap more than you sow. Three, you reap later than you sow. Uh, Pastor Glenn said it right earlier, earlier today. If you tithe and you think it should work the first time, get into the rhythm. Get into the rhythm. If you think church should fix everything on one visit, if you can come once a year, everything's good, come back next year. No, no, no. Get into the rhythm. If you feel like you're not connecting with your life group and you've been there once, get into the rhythm. There is something that happens when we get into the rhythm that means at some point this returns in all of its fullness, above and beyond, overflowing beyond anything we may think, ask, or imagine. That's what God does. And then... We sow from what we've reaped because it's cyclical. Tithing is cyclical. Getting out of debt is cyclical because you keep doing the same thing and you do it again and the next month comes around and you do the same thing again. You do the right thing again. A, a budget is cyclical. You can't write a budget and live by that for the rest of your life because life doesn't work like that. It works in cycles so things come around. So for our family, we have to have birthday budget in the first five months of the year because we worked out that if we have the children at this time, it's not going to hit us twice in one month. No, we didn't do that. But that's how it worked out for us. So there's a cycle to our budgeting that means that there's certain things that have to land at the right time. Because God has put all these things in place, all these principles in place. And we are throwing our money at things, hoping that something good happens when we could be sowing. Let me talk to you about what sowing looks like. i just got a couple of minutes. Sowing for us, let me tell you three things sowing looks like for us as a family. Number one, the chair offering. There's no tithe in that for us because the tithe's God's. So I can't go to God and go, God, I'm going to sow what's yours and I'd like you to bless me. That's not how it works. It was his. So I can't sow it and expect him to bless my life. He's just blessed himself. Thank you very much. So for us, the chair offering, how does it work? Same way it worked for Moses' parents. Number one, they applied faith to the situation. Hebrews tells us that they're in faith. They recognized who Moses was and they looked after him and they sold him in faith. Second thing is this, they made sure they had prepared how to sow him. So this is what they did. They created a basket. They pulled the papyrus leaves from the river that they were going to put him into. They weaved a basket. Do you know what the better word for basket is? It's not a great word, basket. It's not a good translation. The best translation is the word ark. They made an ark to save the seed. When we apply faith and we create the thing, that is God's promise and we put it, sow it, it's amazing what it releases. What does the parable of the sower teach us on that very first level? That his word sown into our lives is an incredible treasure that will produce fruit. So when I hear 2 Corinthians 9.10 and I realize that there's bread for eating and there's seed for sowing, and that God will increase the harvest of righteousness from that, I create a little ark and I say, God, I'm saying that this is your word to me and I'm going to carry that and I'm going to believe that and I'm going to believe that when I saw in the chairs, I'm going to see you come through for my family. I'm going to see you come through for my city. I'm going to see you come through for my nation. I'm going to see you come through in this world because I'm, I'm just sowing into the ark. What's the ark? It's the presence of God. It carries his presence. But this is what they did. They took the mixture with which they made the bricks and they lined the inside of the ark. Listen, 
The thing that has enslaved you, the thing that you feel is crippling you, the thing you feel is holding you back, the thing you feel is breaking you, God can take that, He can use it, and He can use it to carry the seed that will set you free. The very thing that you think is there to ruin you is actually there to carry the seed that will set you free. And then they coated it in pitch so that it was waterproof. And they didn't throw it into the middle of the Nile. They placed it by the bank in the midst of the reeds so that it wouldn't float away. And at that place, they watched over it. Listen, when we're sowing the seed of our finance, watch over it. Don't just throw it out there and say, I hope it does something. I hope it makes a difference. Sow it into something that's great. So we sow into chairs. But you know the next thing we do with all those same principles? Man, we sow into compassion. We sow into these five children that we sow into and we go, you know, we'll look after them. We figured this, there's five of us. We should look after five other people. And so that's what we did. And every month we sow into it and we write to them and we care for them and we, you know, we encourage them and we see, what do we see? Harvest. It's not just that one child's life who's transformed. Because when they get educated and they get fed and they get health care, what happens is that spills out into their family and not just their immediate family. When you go and see, you see that it spills out into the wider family, into the village that they're a part of. It's amazing what happens when we do that. And then so we, we saw with our chairs, we saw with compassion. You know another way we saw? Generosity. And we make sure we're generous with people, buying meals, buying clothes, buying petrol. Man, we're buying all sorts of things. Now, this month, there was someone I thought, man, I can really bless them. I bought them something. I thought to myself, never bought anybody anything like this. But this, bless them. And I just go, God, I'm just going to sow it. We're going to end in just a moment. I'm going to hand back to Dorcas and the band. They want to come and join me. And, and, and this, this is the deal. Church, I hope this month, that you've taken the time to look at your budget or to write your budget. I hope you've taken the time to process all the laws that we've talked through, all the principles that we've talked. I, I hope you listen to the conversations around debt and you've worked out how to snowball your giving so that your debt gets decreased quicker. I, I, I hope you've done that. But I hope you'll do this. That in the midst of all that, you'll go, God, where do I need to sow? How do I need to sow? I need to sow with faith. I need to prepare it with the presence of God. I need to make sure it's setting me free. And then I need to watch over it because this is what happens. Miriam watches over it. She meets a princess. A moment later, the princess hands back the baby, which a moment before was going to die, but now is going to live. The mother, Jochebed is her name, ends up not just getting her son back, but being paid to do the thing she loves. Because God is more than able to do that in your life. He can set you up so the thing you love to do, the thing you would do for free if you could do it, He will set you up so that you can get the finance in order to do that, in order to see that through. Then what happens, Moses ends up living in a palace. He becomes a prince in Egypt and he sets his people free. God's got a plan. You see, his plan wasn't just to save a baby because someone sold him into the river. His plan was to save a nation. What he's given you to sow is not about you. What he's given you to sow is much bigger than you. It's much, you've got to widen your vision. You've got to step back and see that what he has put in your hand is life changing, not just for you, not just for your family, but maybe for the sake of the nation. Moses leads the people out of Egypt. While he's leading the nation out of Egypt, in the middle of the nation is a man called Nashom. Nashom in the nation. A nation walks out of Egypt, but his descendants well there's a man called Boaz and a king called David and a king called Solomon and when you read Matthew chapter 1 and it's full you realize that the descendant of Nashom who would not have got out of Egypt except one woman took one seed and sowed it into a river comes Jesus Listen, you do not know the power of your sowing. Your finance, what are you doing with it? Are you throwing it or are you sowing it? Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to pray. So just stand to your feet, bow your head for a moment. We're going to pray together.